On the planet Sara, the squabbling tribes of humanity blew themselves apart with their weapons of war and left the once serene landscape a barren wasteland. With each battle came a victor who would celebrate the enemy slaughtered and call the devastated environment a byproduct of justice. This apocalyptic back and forth continued for a millennia until an incredible revelation dawned on the humans of Sarah. What if we stopped killing each other? <gasps> This flash of mind-blowing insight resonated deeply with all sides of this age of Armageddon. Surely after a thousand years of warfare, people were tired of missing limbs, missing family members, and what I can only imagine was an insanely inflated price for gravestones. Whatever the reason, humanity gave up their hunger for war and replaced it with a passion for knowledge, for art, and for science. With this thought revolution came an age of prosperity, where love and innovation reigned supreme over greed and dominance. The result was beautiful. Beautiful and fleeting. New technology had been developed, oh yes, and most of the population was less bloodthirsty and warmongering, but evil was not gone. Those primal instincts for dominance lurked within the not-so-enlightened but kinda on its way society, and all it took was a gold rush to bring those monkey habits right the hell back out. What do I mean by a gold rush? Ha! Huh, don't worry, I'm not crazy. Because there was a gold rush for energy. In energy rush, if you will, that scrambled to fuel the energy demands of this technologically booming society. What with all their hypnocopters, technopads, and social what's it it's no surprise how much energy they needed to keep that hip rigmarole going. Of course, it's unclear if the humans on Sarah actually had any of that technology, but that wouldn't lend itself well to me making an old man joke about those hip kids these days and their technobabble it. Anyway, the answer to this energy crisis would be found in emulsion, a substance that through a lab procedure can be converted into pure energy. And the name of the game was emulsion. Bye bye bye! Prices rising every day! Demand through the roof! Emulsion is killing it! It's the biggest thing since sliced bread! It's gonna break the market! Oh god, it did break the market. Uh, looks like we're back to war and shit's on fire. And to make matters worse, a race of gross humanoid reptile mutants was accidentally mutated into existence as a side effect of emulsion exposure on the people who mined it. Oh, no, oh, oh, geez. Oh, well, it was a nice 75 years of prosperity, eh, boys? About 925 years shorter than the age of Armageddon, but what are you gonna do? These gross humanoid icky guys are called locusts, and on Emergence Day, this day that will live in infamy, they broke free from their underground world and decimated the human populations on the surface because us monkey fools were fractured and weak. Separated into the Coalition of Ordered Governments, COG, and the Union of Independent Republics, the UIR, because of the war over emulsion. This weakness led to the killing of a quarter of the world's population in a single day, setting the stage for the first Gears of War to start 14 years later. Just long enough to make that catastrophe really sink in and create that gritty, muscular world the franchise is known for. Indeed, with the stage set, these humans on planet Sarah are ready to boom Kabao blam their way to glory against the locust hordes. Because to save humanity from extinction would be the most glorious victory of all, right? Right? Please tell me these sweet chainsaw guns are fighting the good fight? Uh, well, at the very least, they're fighting the awesome fight. A fight so awesome it spanned an entire trilogy under the Gears of War name and promises to bring a fourth installment soon enough. Gears of War has stuck around since 2008 because it revolutionized something. There's a reason that Halo, Uncharted, Bioshock, and other long-running epic tale-telling franchises keep on barreling along. It's because their gameplay was different somehow, and the style fit beautifully into a universe which set to tell an epic tale. Halo figured out how to make first-person shooter games actually work on a console while taking you through the fucking shit up journey of Master Chief. Uncharted put you in the driver's seat of a kinda arrogant smooth talking charmer guy and gave you quick time action events that blended amazingly with that character's story. Gears of War is no different. It uses a combat system that demands you take cover or die and shoot
shoot lots of stuff while taking you through the war-torn world of Sarah. So gas up your chainsaw gun, do squats until your quads burst through your armor pants, and scowl forever deeply at the world around you as it tries to devour your species for the sins it committed in the name of… innovation? Justice? Prosperity? Eh, maybe not. Welcome, my fellow gear, to the story you never knew. Let's start at the beginning of Gears of War 1, because I'm a sense-making kinda guy. It's been 14 years since Emergence Day, humanity's population has dwindled, and things are looking bleak. The Coalition of Ordered Governments, or COG, has transformed the Jacinto Plateau, the last safe refuge for humanity, into a fortress to protect them from the Locust Horde. The COG has gone on the defensive, leaving an opening for Marcus Phoenix to change the future of humanity. Enter Marcus Phoenix. Our protagonist Marcus Phoenix gets freed from prison by his buddy Dominic Santiago and due to his previous army experience is transported to meet up with the members of Delta Squad. More like DELT Squad! Anyway, where was I? Oh yes, skipping to the end of Gears of War 1, DELT Squad does the most human thing possible and bombs the crap out of the Locusts with a light mass bomb, after which Marcus's boss, Colonel Hoffman, announces the Gears' victory to the world, the supposed end to this revolutionary game. That is, until the Locust Queen says her piece. They do not understand. They do not know why we wage this war. Why we cannot stop. Will not stop. The Locusts have not been defeated. There will be a second game. Woo! Unnecessary excitement aside, this raises questions about the entire Locust Human War. I mean, sure, the Locusts did attack first, and it was necessary to retaliate to defend the human race, but why did they attack? What changed in their underground paradise of a home to make them so desperate as to wage a war with humanity on the surface? It couldn't have been out of pure bloodlust. Maybe Gears of War 2 can shed some light on that, and ultimately help answer our all-important question of whether or not humanity are the good guys here. Sure, we play from their perspective, but are they the heroes of this story? But before we do that, remember when humanity was experiencing their energy crisis and they stumbled upon emulsion during an oil exploration drill? As we touched on earlier, the demand for emulsion ignited a war, and prolonged exposure to this glowing goop actually infects and mutates living beings. And by living beings, I mean literally everything with a pulse. Humans, locusts, and other animals. These mutated beings are known as the Lambent. As it turns out in Gears of War 2, emulsion seeped into the hollows, the underground ground area where the locusts live. Because of this, a large sect of locusts have become lambent due to extended emulsion exposure. These lambent are hell-bent on overthrowing the Locust Queen and taking over the Nexus, the capital city of the Locust Underground, uh, paradise. This locust lambent civil war is the reason why the locust hive is so set on taking control of the surface. Without a cure to emulsion, locust forces are doomed to an eternal civil war if they stay underground with all that poisonous goo. Hence the desperate attack on humans in order to save themselves. But Marcus is like, nah brah, I got other plans, let's take this super nifty hammer of dawn and blow up this scary enemy. Which ultimately caused Jacinto Plateau to sink and flood the hollows with tasty seawater. Water, drowning both the Locust Horde and the Lambent. You think it's over now, don't you? Well, it ain't over yet! Gears 3 reminds us how resilient the Lambent are when they start popping up from underground like stupid little diglets. Oh, and Locust forces still have some bases on the surface, making things a bit more difficult. Until the end of Gears 3, that is, when out of left field, Marcus's dad turns on a generator with the Lambent Cure, which kills the Lambent and Locust forces, sacrificing himself in the process. Okay, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Yeah. But what of our initial question? Are the Locusts really the evil ones here, and are humans really the good ones here? The actions of the Locusts seem very human-like in nature. They are hit with adversity in the form of this civil war, and proceed to do whatever it takes to allow their species to live in prosperity. Emulsion poisoning is a greater threat than the humans on the surface. The only way for them to get out of this war they have no chance of winning is to start a war where there is an actual chance of survival. They needed to band together as one cohesive species to protect themselves 
themselves, which is exactly what the humans had to do in order to fend off this attack. So in the grand scheme of things, locusts and humans are going to war for the same reason survival. The only thing is that it is our fault the locusts had to worry about survival in the first place. What with flooding their home with poisonous liquid and all, eh, maybe we're not that great. We only see the locusts as the attacker, the foreign enemy on our soil. Is that any different than the wars during the age of Armageddon, or World War II, or the modern day wars in the Middle East? History is written by the victor, so how do you tell who is actually the good guy? The line between who's good and who's bad is typically extremely blurry. While you may not completely agree with one side or the other, they will force you to pick a side. You can either choose COG or the UIR, peanut butter or jelly, Mary Kate or Ashley, but what if we combined them? fused them into a single whole, a single human race, a single people, united in the face of oblivion, onwards to new horizon. <gasps> Who is that? And what have they done? We were gonna make humanity become one and stop fighting with itself. <laughs> What's that? It's more complicated than that. Philosophical disagreements, order bringing government versus freedom of choice. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. All right, thanks. Thanks so much. All right, bye. What you just witnessed was a recreation of a phone call. A phone call we had the pleasure of having with a trusted source close to the Gears franchise. So thanks, anonymous and trusted source. What this mysterious person told us is that many of the differences that facilitated humanity to go to war with itself were not necessarily greed. So maybe we humans aren't all that terrible. There were also philosophical differences, ones that do not coexist so easily in a dangerous world. We are talking about a group of order governments versus a group of independent republics. Now most of what Mysterious Source Dude talked about had to do with the conflict between the COG and a group called the Stranded, not between the COG and the UIR. But is it such a stretch to say that the COG and UIR bickered about the same stuff? A kind of order versus freedom bickering. For those who don't know, the Stranded are a ragtag group of people who live outside the COG stronghold because they'd rather risk death than give up their personal freedoms that the strict COG government simply prohibits. Many of these Stranded are even former UIR members. Yay consistency! Any side of these human wars over the millennia could have facilitated peace agreements with the other side. In fact, what I neglected to mention is that this did happen for a brief period of time between the COG and the UIR before the Locust invasion. Even then, the COG had to threaten the UIR with satellite death beam technology to make it happen. But how long would that piece have lasted? How much do you really trust your enemy? Personally, I don't trust my enemies that much. It's like the United States versus the Soviet Union during the Cold War. When the Soviets said they were totally just testing this hydrogen bomb for research and retaliatory purposes, did it make old Nixon feel better? Not really. Those Ruskies had their finger on the button, and we knew it! In a world so used to war, is peace so easy when another nation's way of life is so different than yours that it seems to threaten everything you were born and raised to believe? Who's really right about the best way to live in this crazy crazy world? It's gotta be your nation, right? But what if the other guys win? What if they take control? That would be the end of everything. We can't let our defenses down for a second! So the thought process goes. Finding the solution or even a villain for the situation is difficult, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Ah, gray areas. So then will humanity finally unite after barely saving themselves from the locusts? Should they even unite? The world is still so dangerous and societal ideologies could make or break how we handle the next catastrophe. The human race rallying under a single banner and making peace isn't just a matter of hitting the off switch. It's a matter of reconciling key differences in opinion on how life can be lived. Would you give up the freedom to be who you want and do what you want if it means being safe? Here in the western world on Earth, you'd almost certainly say no. But what if you lived on planet Sarah, where hellish reptilian armies might spring from the ground and devour your innards at any moment? That decision ain't so easy now, is it? Freedom over safety is great. Until you die. So thank you, trusted source, for shoving our hippy-dippy gobbledygook into the confines of bullshit where it belongs. Sure, a united humanity that didn't want to kill itself would be ideal, but it's a lot more complicated than that. So then what about that question? Are we the good guys in this story? As far as the locust-human war is concerned, eh, 
eh, that's pretty much all our fault. As for us warring with ourselves for over a thousand years and destroying the natural landscape in the process, we're clearly dealing with problems more complex than mere greed and bloodlust. Really, whether humans are good or bad all depends on if humanity learns from its mistakes. Can we coexist peacefully? Only Gears of War 4 will tell. Maybe, just maybe, we'll be able to reconcile our ideological differences before an outside threat forces us to unite. Probably not, but maybe. The road to peace is not so simple. The road to war, however, that's where everything is laid out on the table. Suffice to say, we trust our war machines more than we do our shaky diplomatic agreements. War makes sense. Peace is goddamn confusing. That's the story. You never knew. Well, that was some deep stuff. Just like usual, am I right? That's the dream, anyway. And you know what else is dreamy? The fact that we release a story you never knew every Thursday now. That's right. Check in every Thursday for a new story that'll blow your mind and give you hee-hees and ha-has. Just clickety-clack that subscribe button and poof, your dreams will come true. So press it. And to celebrate this monumental accomplishment of getting one of these videos out every week, I'd like to thank the whole Treesicle team. I'm Grant, merely one-fourth of Treesicle who does the voice work, and these three guys, Tyler, Kevin, and Ryan, they're pretty cool too. So whenever you watch one of our videos, know that four pairs of hands helped with making it. Four! That's eight hands in total! And last but not least, I'd like to thank Microsoft and the Coalition for their help with this video. We couldn't have done it without them. Ah, so many thank yous. And with that, I'll see you later. Toodaloo! Until next time.